collective uh, mobilization that has come an awfully long way. And I'm proud that in France, uh, before you Four years now, we have made the subject of equality between uh, men and women a major national uh, cause. Uh, now, there was a before and an after on, in terms of the uh, w World's Women Conference of 1999, and there will be a before and after for the uh, um, Generation Equality Forum. And uh, so I don't, there doesn't seem to be a translation for two people who are uh, sitting next to me and who don't speak uh, French. And, uh, so I think this is going to make this uh, very uninteresting for, for them. So perhaps we can uh, give a headset uh, to them. I, I, I could do this in two languages, but it's going to be very difficult for me. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. I was we have. You are extremely polite, disciplined, respectful, but it is clear that you cannot understand what I'm saying. And, and it could be the beginning of a misunderstanding. <laughs> so the people in the room, do you have uh, those things that you uh, listen through? Uh, so perhaps I can organize uh, with one of the organ uh, uh, negotiate with one of the organizers to have one of these headsets. Uh. Okay. I negotiated one for you. And there you go. Merci, vous êtes adorable. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Voilà. Merci, uh, okay, thank you. Aux deux Français qui avec so uh, those uh, two French people who are listening to me uh, with, uh, 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 with their headsets and were willing to give up their headsets. Uh, so as I was saying, we want things to change. And uh, this forum, and I'm going to be very brief, uh, needs to be a forum for mobilization and also action. So we have to be here and be ready to say what we want to do and the money we're uh, prepared to give uh, to back that up. Uh, because uh, what we're dealing with today is about uh, half of humanity. There are many uh, uh, people who confuse the issue of uh, equality between men and women with the issue of diversity. 51% of uh, humanity, of mankind, uh, uh, is faced by this uh, problem. And so we have to face these challenges because it's really a urgent. Uh, so it's urgent because of the context and and uh, this is not something that we have planned for. I'm talking about the uh, pandemic, the pandemic that we continue to fight against. Uh, and uh, this has led to uh, an incredible regression in terms of the issue of equality. Even though uh, men were in the first line in terms of uh, fighting the pand pandemic, they're also the most impacted. Uh, 47 million extra women have now become poor due to the pandemic. And millions of others uh, often have been deprived of, uh, hel of health uh, and uh, contraception uh, to the peril of their lives, e including in our own countries, and I'm uh, also referring to France, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the lockdown, uh, uh, viol violence, uh, domestic violence, uh, those have increased uh, uh, greatly. 500 million uh, men and uh, women and girls are uh, illiterate and many have uh, dropped out of school. Uh, people often said that uh, COVID was an antisocial virus because it hit the most vulnerable people. But uh, on top of that, it's an anti-feminist uh, uh, virus. That's quite ob obvious. Uh, the second thing which... Uh, uh, so the uh, second reason for uh, urgency is uh, the, um, the bad uh, co context uh, which is uh, 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 spreading across our continents. There are pa patriarchal forces who are trying to take over the power again uh, uh, and uh, a return to conservatism. And these people want uh, to uh, challenge the gains that have been made over deca decades. And, and while we were preparing for this meeting, and I, w I was struck by a, a, s a sentence by uh, Simon de Beauvoir, uh, who said several decades ago, never forget that we only need one political, economic, re or religious crisis uh, uh, for women's rights uh, to be uh, challenged. Uh, and uh, here we are, unfortunately, at that particular stage. And uh, very clearly, with uh, different uh, um, reasons depending on the uh, continent, uh, so 
religions are being uh, uh, becoming more and more con conservative and uh, rights that we believe to be universal now become options. Uh, people who uh, want to, to drive, uh, women who want to drive cars uh, are being criticized or, or uh, so those people who uh, want to wear a veil are also uh, threatened. So this is why we are here today. Uh, we are here uh, to say and to show our support for these women, but also so also to say that their fight is also our fight. We're here for the honor of uh, lawyers and journalists uh, like Mujain and uh, the Uyghur women and so many other women as well. We are here for the honor of women who demonstrate uh, against uh, uh, the withdrawal of Turkey from the Istanbul uh, Convention, the Yazidi women uh, faced with the horrors of uh, Daesh. Uh, and we are here for all those women uh, who are tired of being uh, second-class citizens, uh, to use uh, uh, a formula uh, created by you, you, Rosa Parks. So in terms of all these emergency situations, uh, there is, however, some hope. Uh, there's hope because, uh, and I really want to thank uh, those people who have come here, despite the pandemic, from their own countries in difficult situations uh, to uh, show their support for this fight. And there's hope. Uh, hope because we are uh, strong and there are uh, many feminist uh, fights going on and then the feminist agenda that we are going to be uh, addressing today. And I state very clearly, I claim with the leaders that are here today that I am a feminist, a feminist uh, uh, because uh, feminism is humanism, defending the dignity of uh, women, the rights of women is at the same time defending the dignity and the rights of, uh, of uh, humankind. They're not se separable. The combat of um, this is a combat for humanity, for men and women together. These are inseparable uh, in terms of uh, their destiny and their conditions. So, yes, the rights of women and uh, girls are universal, just like human rights uh, are. And uh, we cannot uh, give in to this regression, so, to this backpedaling. Uh, and uh, people will explain that because of a tradition, a certain interpretation or a certain uh, uh, habit, a certain interpretation of uh, religion, uh, fighting against a certain form of decanism, uh, we cannot uh, separate uh, these uh, uh, rights and uh, challenge them or question them. Now, in order to answer this, we're going to uh, adopt a particular methodology, uh, so uh, concrete universalism and uh, 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 multilateralism, which we all defend. So first of all, we're going to listen the voices of those who are carrying this uh, and uh, carrying out this fight uh, for equality, uh, the N NGOs, uh, organi international organizations under the auspices of the UN. Uh, and we will also act uh, concretely so that uh, life uh, uh, changes uh, everywhere, so that in the morning, uh, women the world over will uh, feel hope Full, and they will be able to. We will be able to show that we will not uh, give give up on anything. We want uh, concrete results, and this uh, forum must be the forum of uh, concrete results. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Monsieur le Président, chers amis et chers amis. L'égalité de genre est essentiellement une question de pouvoir et de pouvoir dans un monde qui est encore largement dominé par les hommes et avec une culture encore largement patriarcale. Et s'il y a une chose que j'ai appris dans ma vie, le pouvoir is actually never given up. You want to grasp it. And this is one of the logics that is behind this forum. We want to mobilize the basic movements, the grassroots movements. We want to create coalitions. We want to get the resources that we need to balance these rapport uh, forces in, within the world. I've got a five comments to make on our five priorities. Firstly, equality, equality of rights. In this world, there's too much discrimination and too many discriminatory rights. So we've got to make sure that it's clear that equal rights, equality of rights is actually translated into proper equality, real equality. And that's where the social, social civil society comes in. 
As the President has said, when we see that there is actually a move backwards by many of the political leaders in the world who are calling into question what we've achieved over years and decades, the second comment is, is parity. If equality is really a question of power, parity is also important for how we distribute power. Parity within public administrations, parity within companies, parity within international organizations, and in particular, parity at the level, and particularly at the level, a level, at the level where decisions are taken. If there's something I'm proud of, it's the fact that in the UN, after only three years, we have managed to ensure that we have parity in the, in the high leadership. We have, out of 110 men and women, where we have parity between men and women, we have got uh, 140 men and women working in parity across the world and in the leadership levels. And there's only a third, actually, three years ago. Parity is a key element if we want to redistribute power and if we want to create the, tradition, the, the, the conditions for gender equality. And yes, I see a difference here. I see in the, the quality decisions that are taken. I see a difference also in the work environment where uh, sexual harassment is much more difficult. I also see that there's a greater capacity to have gender equality at the heart of every policy and every initiative that we work on within the UN system. Third issue is economic uh, parity, economic equality, equal wages. Again, it's a question also of employment, social protection. It's a question also of the health economy, the informal economy. That's the first victim as far as the economy is concerned. This is, this is the, first, the first victim of COVID-19, in particularly in developed countries, uh, developing countries, where women play a central role in the informal uh, economy and where they're paying the price of the, of the pandemic. And then st let's stop violence against women and girls. This is a key issue, a key point that the president has said, this things are getting worse with the COVID pandemic. Violence in all conflicts, in all tragic situations that we see across the world, we see violence, but there's also violence on the street and in our homes. One of the most difficult things that I had to do when I was prime minister in Portugal, that was to actually convince the Portuguese population, the society, that there was a real problem of domestic violence and to take the measures that we needed to take to actually come to a, a, an end of this uh, violence. People said, no, 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 that's not true, that's not true, we don't have that problem, that's happened somewhere else, it doesn't happen in our houses. Well, we've got to really fight that type of logic where people deny the reality. We've got to make sure that we fight against violence violence, violence against women and children, and that has got to be the key of all of our policies and our objectives. And the final point I wanted to make, the final, my final point, I am very confident to the new generation. I think that the intergenerational dialogue is absolutely essential if we want gender equality. But we've got to remember that in our society, we haven't yet got the, the, the institutional mechanisms that work correctly so that young people can effectively intervene at decision-making level in either social, societal terms or in political or economic terms. So we want to imagine that in this new digital society, we will enable young people to play a much more effective role in our decision-making mechanisms. That, I think, is another key tool for us to achieve gender equality. And then just two very quick final comments. And I just wanted to actually underscore what the president has said, that we now are seeing a regression championed by some political or economic leaders and religious leaders of throughout the world. We need, if I can say it in English, we've got to push back against the pushback. It is an ideological battle, and we have got to win that ideological battle for, for us to counter these conservative forces across the world and who are calling into question the achievements that we got from Beijing. And we are living in a society which is more and more digitalized with an economy which is a digital economy. But that's where there is a real trap for gender equality because the in technological, in, in the to technological um, careers, we have a majority of, of men. And that has a huge impact. Misogyny is in 
Silicon Valley, it's in the Silicon Valleys of this world. And when we see the impact of this majority, male majority population in uh, software and in the algorithms, it's clear to see that they are biased against women. One simple example, an American couple where the woman was actually wealthier than the man went to open up two accounts in a bank. They asked for credit cards, and the credit limit for the man was a lot higher than the credit limit for the woman, even though the woman was actually more, uh, was actually more wealthy than the man. So they kicked up a bit of a stink, and the bank man officer said, and the bank manager said, no, 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 that's, that's actually the way the computer does these things. It's the, it was the algorithm that brought up, that, 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 that decided that. And because of these algorithms that are developed using artificial intelligence and all other tools, that we have in our digital economy, the, the, there's a bias, there's a very clear bias. So we've got to reestablish a gender ba balance in that area as well, which is a key area for the future, so that the question of power can actually be properly addressed at all levels. This forum is a great opportunity. It, it will enable us to come together and to join forces in this battle, which is important for both women and men. It's essential for us all. Now I'll give the floor to uh, the, the Executive Director of UN Women. Thank you very much, uh, dear President, and thank you for having us. Thank you to France and Mexico. Thank you for to France and Mexico for both countries made this day possible. Thank you, SG. And thank you to the President of the European Union and our youth representative for being here. Women everywhere in the world are squeezed into a small corner. Women make up one quarter of those who are managers. They are one quarter of parliamentarians around the world. They are one quarter of those who negotiate in climate change. They are less than a quarter of those who negotiate peace agreements. And all these decisions have a fundamental impact in their capacity to have a life that is meaningful. When I started to work for UN Women, my budget was also one quarter of a billion. And it was meant to increase to half a billion, and this was my assignment. Of course, we did that, and we went past of that. Clearly, that was never enough. That was never enough for the large problem that we face in society that impacts on women. And so, I went out to you, many of you in this room, to assist. I went to private sector philanthropist to young people, both young people and adolescents, to civil society who were already part and parcel of fighting for change for women. I also went to civil society who was another strategic ally for UN women. Because generation equality, which brings us together here for both me and President Macron is about change. It is about moving from making promises to telling us what you are going to do for the situation of women to change. So today, so that I'm not unclear, I'm going to have to tell you what we have been able to do. We have almost 
1,000 commitments that have been made by member states, by private sector and the other actors that I have highlighted, which will change the lives of women in the six areas that we have identified in generation equalities. Countries from the south have put their foot forward. Regional organizations like the AU and the EU have put their foot forward. Young people, through their advocacy, have put their foot forward. And philanthropists and private sector and our member states have put their foot forward. So we now have over $23 billion that has been put forward by all these <laughs> actors. And we're still counting, but maybe President Macron will have a different number than me. Private sector will use some of the money for the changes that need to happen in their companies. The philanthropic organization will use the money for grants, and I'm glad that some of the grants will support small grassroots organizations, youth organizations to do their work. And of course, member states have committed to change policies, programs, including making sure that the number of women that are represented in their government increases. I have governments who are here today and at home who will tell you about what they are going to do. I don't want to steal their thunder. So today is a happy day from that perspective, but this is not everything we need. The fight still has to continue. What we are doing today is to take a step forward. We are extending the number of people who participate in gender equality. We are also intergenerational in that young people are at the core of what we do. If what we do does not benefit and change the lives of young people, we would have lost it all together. We thank you for the contribution that you have made, but also we call on you to stay with us to monitor what we do with these resources. In UN Women, we have put in place a secretariat that will oversee the implementation of this and will report. We have organizations that will also implement in group. In the care system, we have organizations that will implement together. In police that will change their policing into gender responsiveness, they will be a group of countries that are coming together. And some of them will name their, uh, will, will say who they are. So this is what we see as enhanced multilateralism. This is what we see as support to the work that we do in an intergovernmental inter inter space where we need to be pushing up all the time so that there is a race to the top. I want to say one quarter is not enough. One quarter is not equality. Equality is one half where both men and women are together. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will give the mic to uh, Chantelle Marekera, founders of uh, Little Dreamers Foundation. Chantelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Macron. And as President Macron has said, we are here for concrete results. And as youth, we are saying we are here and we mean business. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean, what I mean when I say we mean business. <laughs> Stop 
Dear world, I'm here for us to have a conversation. <laughs> a conversation. Dear world, fighting for women and girls' rights is hard. And as Elena Cohen would say, it is a protest. A protest against, a protest for, and a protest within. It, a, it is a story of everyday struggle and collective resistance, which is even harder when you're 24, in college, holding two part-time jobs, and still trying to run a non-profit preschool and balancing all that with advocacy work. And just two weeks ago, as the youth leaders, we held a pre-Paris conference where we brought all young people together, and we were literally sleeping at 2 or 3 a.m. every day. And we had to be up by 5 a.m. the next day to finish off school deadlines. But we continue doing it. In spite of it all, we continue to fight. We continue to fight because the cause is way bigger than all of us. And it is this cause that has brought us all together in this room today. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Chantal Marikira, and I am a member of the Generation Equality Youth Task Force. and a girl advocate from Zimbabwe. And as a youth leader who has had the privilege to be involved in the GF through the Youth Task Force and through the Action Coalition Working Group, I know all about the monumental work that is being done in this intergenerational and multi-stakeholder process to transform power and to change the lived realities of women all over the world. But as I was reflecting, <laughs> it occurred to me that being in this room today is a privilege. Watching online, being among the 40,000 plus people watching online is a privilege. Knowing about the Generation Equality Forum is a privilege. And with privilege comes great responsibility. And so now my question to you is, what responsibility do we owe to all those who don't have the privilege to be in these spaces? That 15-year-old girl from Murambinda, Zimbabwe, who has faced all the bruises of patriarchy every single day of her life, left, right, and center, married off at the age of 15, simply because the parents wanted to raise money for her brother's fees because the brother, after all, is the one who has to carry off the legacy of the family, right? The brother is the one who has to take over the lineage of the family, right? It sounds silly that we're still talking about this in 2021. Like, this is 2021, but here we are, the same conversation every year. So now, what do those people want? What does that 16-year-old girl want? That person in Murambinda, in Zarabani, what do they want? What they want is real substantive impact impact, real and tangible impact. And that's what I want us all to keep in mind as we kick, we, as we kick start this forum today. Thank you to all those thousands um, of organizations who have made commitments to civil society, governments, UN women, everyone who has made commitments. Thank you, those 150 plus youth-led organizations who have made commitments. Yes, we are doing it. But on behalf of those who don't have the privilege to be here, on behalf of the Youth Task Force, on behalf of the National Gender Youth Activists, on behalf of the Youth Action Coalition Coalers, on behalf of civil society as a whole, we now demand accountability, transparency, and real substantive impact for all our constituencies. Yes, the commitments are now on paper, but now we call all the commitment makers to see their commitments through Enough is enough. And as E.D. Mama Pumze would say, we are done talking. We are done talking. <laughs> we are done talking. <laughs> right now, what we need is transformative change. Change that is visible to everyone, not just those in this room or those participating in the forum virtually, but even those who have no idea about the Jeff. 
We want women and girls and gender diverse individuals from every part of the world to notice this sudden shift in the air and start questioning, wait, why is there a noticeable shift in racial justice, in economic justice, in education, etc.? And then we'll be there, standing proud, and we'll be saying, we did that. That's that intergenerational multi-stakeholder process did that. It is our process. And as we start off this forum, dear world, the Paris Forum is not the end. It's just the beginning. And over the next five years, I just want to let everyone who is watching, everyone in this room, everyone who is watching online, I want you all to know that we will be watching, we will be monitoring, and we will hold you accountable to your commitments. Thank you. Thank you, Chantelle. Uh, Dr. Fung really wanted just to make a precision. Well, uh, dear president, I just wanted to correct myself. We actually have 40 billion, not 20 billion. We have 40 billion. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. On va maintenant passer Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, hand the microphone to other people. I'm going to President of the Merci European uh, Council, Mr. Charles Michel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Thank you also for your commitment and the commitment from France and your own personal intervention here today. I think that dignity, gender equality, the gender equality of opportunity, this is really at the heart of the European uh, Union's values as well. It's at the heart of our construction of Europe. And I think that while we are working collectively to, uh, to, to get along with this digital transformation that we're going through, this was mentioned by a previous speaker, the, the also the, the climate transformation, well, this is also an opportunity for us to actually manage this change without actually committing the errors of the past, by using all of our talent, by making sure that gender equality is actually at the heart of these changes and that enables us to actually bring about these economic and social changes, enabling us to move forward stronger than in the past, carrying with us these values of humanism and humanity. The second point I wanted to make, the second point I wanted to raise is the, que is the idea that, that education is the key to all of this because it's in our bra brains, it's in our minds that these changes have to got to happen to mobilize everyone to ensure that we know that we understand that this equality of rights and opportunity has got to be at the center of everything we do and the third element that I wanted to raise it's true we see this that for some time we have seen in Europe and elsewhere there have been some uh, uh, attempts to try and call into question progress which we have made in the past progress that which we have worked for and it's at this time when we're mobilizing for the future at a forum of this type where we're bringing together people who have, are sure of the path we've got to take the this is a key juncture because we have got to be together and stand up together and say, as the Secretary General said, we have got to make sure that we push back those who are pushing back. That's why this forum, this forum that we're uh, all attending, we've got to be uh, mobilized, we've got to be together, we've all got to be in committed feminists. Humanity can no longer afford the uh, luxury of not actually harnessing half of the talent on this planet. So bravo, well done. Done. I'm optimistic. If we can be together, if we can roll up our sleeves, the, be the world ahead is better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, thank you. Now we're going to hand the floor. We're going to move elsewhere. Uh, the Vice President of uh, the USA, Kamala Harris, who normally speaking should be online. And it is hot outside. Greetings from the White House. Yeah. President Macron, President Lopez Obrador. Miss. Big applause to welcome you. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It is, 
It is wonderful to be with you, President Macron, uh, Mr. Secretary General, Madam Executive Director, Chantel, and the Youth Task Force. Thank you for convening this forum. 26 years ago, government and civil society leaders from around the world came together in a forum not unlike this one. In Beijing in 1995, Hillary Rodham Clinton issued a clarion call to the world and the United States became one of 189 nations to adopt the ambitious platform for action. These are points of profound pride for our nation. And for me, it is an honor to be here with you now as we recommit to make gender equality a reality. Over the past five months, I have met many world leaders and we have discussed some of the most pressing issues of our time. COVID-19, climate change, threats to security, and threats to democracy. And in these meetings, I have often made it a point to raise the importance of equal participation of women and girls. Because I believe, as you all do, that addressing gender equity and equality is essential to addressing every other challenge we face, which is certainly true in light of the current threats to democracy. Around the world, democracy is in peril. Strong men have become stronger. Human rights abuses have multiplied. Corruption is undermining progress as misinformation is undermining public confidence. And who gets hurt when democracies fall? when democracies falter? Who gets hurt when democracies fail to live up to their promise? Well, women and girls are among those who suffer. At the G7 summit just weeks ago, world leaders pledged to unite against the threat of autocracy. World leaders pledged to unite behind the principles of democracy. And as we move forward, I believe that if we want to strengthen democracy, we must fight for gender equality. Because here's the truth. Democracy is strongest when everyone participates and it is weaker when people are left out. And we've seen this here in the United States. When women have access to capital, to start a small business, they can participate more fully and our democracy grows stronger. When women have access to reproductive health care, to stay healthy, they can participate more fully and our democracy grows stronger. When women live free from the fear of violence, they can participate more fully and our democracy grows stronger. Throughout my career, I have worked to protect women from violence and exploitation. I know what happens when women are supported. I know what happens when women are heard. When women are heard, whether that is in the courtroom, in the workplace, in the halls of government, or at the ballot box, democracy is more complete. So I know without doubt, gender equality strengthens democracy. And for our part, the United States will make a number of commitments today to reinforce our own institution. And these commitments have one thing in common. They will yield results, real tangible results that improve the lives of women in the United States and women around the world. So in closing, I will address the young leaders who are participating in generation equality. I remain hopeful and optimistic because of you. Our world needs your leadership. And in that role, there are two things I want you to remember. 
First, remember to use the tools of democracy, whether that is the freedom of speech or the freedom to vote. And if you do not yet have those freedoms, fight for them. And know we will fight alongside you. And the second thing I want you to remember is this. Listen to those people who are not being heard. Respect and embrace those whose experiences are different from your own. And recognize who is not in the room and invite them in. And do not forget the power of your own story. When we bring people in, when we bring in all the people, we are more successful, our results are more impactful because democracy is strongest, because our world is stronger when everyone participates. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Vice President. Thank you so much for that and for your speech and your commitment. Now I pass the mic. Je vois à l'écran Madame la Présidente so de la Commission the européenne. The President of the European Commission on the screen, Ursula von der Leyen. Thank you for being with us. La parole est à toi. You have the floor. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, President uh, Macron and, uh, and uh, Executive D Director of uh, UN Women. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to France and Mexico and to uh, UN Women. Thank you for having organized uh, this uh, forum. We are here be because we all have the same desire, the same will, the same to uh, the, the will to achieve 100% uh, equality for all uh, women the world over. And so we are going to be making uh, concrete uh, commitments for more progress uh, uh, more rapidly all over the world uh, so that uh, the, the, our, the generation of our daughters uh, becomes a generation of equality. Progress is too slow. In fact, we are now facing a backlash on basic women's rights. Just think about the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women. Several EU countries have not yet ratified the convention. Others are talking about getting out of it, and this is totally unacceptable. While we keep pushing against this trend, I will put forward, together with my college, that is gender balance, we will put forward new legislation by the end of the year, a law to combat violence against women, from prevention to protection and prosecution, online and offline. And we will propose to add all forms of hate crime to the list of crimes spelled out in the European Union treaties. And this includes violence against women, as well as hate crimes against LGBTIQ people. Because freedom from fear is the most basic of rights. And it must be guaranteed for all, whatever their gender, whomever they love. Generation equality means much more than protection from violence. It also means quality education for girls, support to women entrepreneurs, expanding sexual and reproductive health rights. The European Union's new budget for foreign policy will contribute to these goals. And you asked to be concrete. It was just approved. And this part of the budget is worth 79 billion euros. At least 85% of the new actions will contribute to gender equality. And at least 4 billion euro will be specifically dedicated to women's and girls' rights and empowerment. These investments and actions will contribute to this forum's global acceleration plan. This is concrete action for generation equality. Diversity makes us richer. 
the world that we build for the next generation should not just be greener and more digital, but also more equal and more diverse, so that the next generation of women will truly be generation equality. Let's work for this together. And I really thank you for your attention in this wonderful meeting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Ursula. Thank you, uh, President uh, dear Ursula. Now I'm going to hand the floor to the President of Mexico. I'm very pleased to be able to address you as the forum uh, on equality begins that we began, and also which began in earnest in the month of uh, March. And uh, so we would like to greet uh, the uh, uh, France and Mexico and uh, spend special, special greetings uh, to President uh, Macron and all those people who are participating in the forum and uh, organized it. Uh, it is so important to talk about equality not just uh, gender equality, of course. We are all equal, men and women, and we must continue to fight against uh, uh, machoism, but we should never forget uh, economic and social equality. This is crucial in, in order to have a, a better society. Here I have a fighter, a statue of a fighter, a fi someone who fought for equality. Jose Maria Moreno. Jose Mar uh, Maria Moreno. And he, justo, this fighter uh, in 1813, he pronounced a, a document which is called the Sentiments of a Nation. And in this particular document, amongst other things, it says that, um, that poverty should be reduced, uh, that there must be equality. In this document, it also states that that um, everyone is equal. And Morenos said in very simple terms uh, that uh, from the farmer's son and uh, to the uh, people working in the mines and uh, also the sons of the, the richest people on earth. Uh, and he also said that there should be courts that defend the weak uh, people from the abuses of the powerful. This was what uh, Moreno said, and his, this was his fight for equality. And this, you can see, it was very simple, and yet it was very deep-rooted. Uh, and uh, this is what our heroes have taught us, uh, that we must fight for equality, uh, for justice. As the French did uh, during the revolution. As they said, liberty, equality, and fraternity. So, greetings to all. Merci. Thank you. Thank you to the President of Mexico. Now, before we go into the different themes, and uh, we have a minister who will be organizing one of the themes, and, uh, and we'll be taking them one by one. And then after these introductory words, and before we go into the, the various themes, I will uh, 
we will hear from two generations of uh, uh, um, human rights defenders. So, so I'm going to call onto the to the uh, stage Hillary Clinton and uh, Julieta Martinez. La vice president Harris a rappelé. So. Vice President uh, Harris uh, uh, reminded us of the role played uh, by uh, Hillary Clinton and Julia Martinez uh, in respect of human rights. I am, so, I am so excited to be here with all of you, and particularly uh, with Julieta. And as President Macron just said, uh, this truly is not only generation equality, but also generational equality. And 26 years ago, when the world spoke with one voice that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights once and for all, we made a commitment that was embodied in the Platform for Action, adopted by 189 countries. Imagine, can you think of something we could get 189 countries to agree to today? Well, that has to be our goal, doesn't it? And what we hope is that out of this forum will come the same level of commitment of a mission to continue the progress that was started and spread throughout the world 26 years ago. Julieta, how do you think about the progress that we have made so far and what more would you like to see happen because of generation equality. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Hillary. It's a pleasure to be here sharing this place. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things that I have in mind, but to begin with, I'm thinking about what's the importance of girls and adolescents to be considered in decision making. But I'm pretty sure you know that when I talk about being considered in decision making, I'm not talking about inviting young girls to um, give a motivational speech and that's it, or go to the final picture, pose with us. I'm talking about seeing girls, consider girls as political beings. Girls understand what's happening around them. Girls understand what are the problems, the problematics that are affecting their communities, their realities, and they can and want to be part of the change, of the solutions, of effective solutions. Well, I think I, sh I could introduce myself now. My, na my name is Julieta Martinez. I'm 17 years old. I'm Chilean. I am Latina. But today, on this stage, I don't want to be just Julieta. I am Melanie from Ecuador. I am Daniela from Venezuela. I'm Sofia from Costa Rica. I am Galilea from Mexico. And just to name a few of, my, of the amazing friends and allies that I have in my platform, the, the Tremendas, the Collective. These are girls that are fighting every single day of their lives for their rights, for their causes, for social, for social justice and dignity. But we don't see them. They don't have the spaces. They don't have the tools. They don't have the mechanisms. And you know what's the worst part, Hillary? They feel alone. And for a lot, years and years and years, we have felt alone. And now I'm one of the privileged ones, because there are girls that said, have said to me, I feel like the system has abandoned me. 
So what should we see right now? What's, what's the important thing of, of all of this? I think we should talk about accountability. I think that we have to talk about responsibility. We can't invite girls just for the picture. We can't invite just uh, girls just for the inspirational speech. We need to be part of the decision making. We need to be part of the incidents. Because right now I have the privilege to lear learn English. There's a big language barrier. I was super scared at the beginning. I was saying, gosh, what if I fail talking English? You know? I think there's another thing that I wanted to bring to the table. I think it, it's, it's really important to talk about. And it's about climate justice. I think it's, it's, it's just something that um, Kamala mentioned before, right? Where right now we think we're having a lot of crises. I and we, I really think that we should talk about intersectionality. No, according to the Drawdown Project, it is estimated if we give every single girl in the world access to education and family planning, we could get to reduce up to 105 in a repeat, so 105 gigatons of CO2 for the year, by the year 2050. And I quote Malala, an educated girl not only prescribes quality of life, but enables her to change the world. We need, uh, once again, we need the tools, we need the mechanisms so girls can act and actually search and fight for a more equal future, but also present, a more sustainable future and present. I think there's a lot of things we, are, we need to address. But I think the most important part is that I'm talking right now with the world leaders. And I don't want to sound cliche when I talk about, uh, when I talk about hope, when I talk about the importance of act, I don't want this to sound cliche. Because I see every single day of my life what girls are suffering, that girls are suffering, and that girls felt alone. But we can change this. And we can change for the better. I think if we can take that, this into account, we can actually move forward. I agree with you absolutely, <laughs> completely. And I, I think that the commitments that are being made because of this conference um, can take us a long way. But I agree we need accountability. We need transparency. We need to understand what it is we're trying to achieve together. And when, that, when I said that 26 years ago about women's rights and human rights, now looking back, I believe we have made progress, not near enough, and that we have to recommit ourselves to going even further. But we also need the power to claim those rights. Rights without power adds up to very little. And the way to get that power is through both the kind of organizing and level of commitment that we just heard from Julieta and the young activists from around the world who are here and watching online. And we also need to make sure that the institutions which wield the power in nations, in corporations, in every aspect of the economy, and of society will never be able to turn away again because the demands that will be coming from all of us, but particularly from this next generation, will be unbelievably strong and focused in a way that will demand and expect the changes that these young women deserve. So to all of my veterans who I see here and I know are around the world, to the UN Women, which has carried the banner for so many years now, we are grateful for all that has been done. But we have to do now everything in our power to empower those who are on the front lines of change today. Generation equality is possible if we determine to make it so. Thank you all very, very much.
The microphone's not working, sadly. The microphone is not working. It's 26 years now that since Beijing, but I want to say to you, all of you in the room, and also the 40,000 people who are actually listening to us online, I'd like to welcome you all to this event in France. Today, this day and this moment is very important. It's important for equality between men and women across the whole planet. And we're going to start now to have a panel discussion with a list of panelists who have been waiting to talk about something which is very important to us all. It's a subject which is at the very heart of the uh, Generation Equality Forum, and that is access to education for young women and the uh, economic auto uh, autonomy of women. These are issues which have really been brought into question again by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me first of all invite to join us on this stage, I'd like to invite Madam Ruth Kieta Yago, who is a, a uh, from Bukinia Bay, who is an actress and an, an economist. Uh, Miss Alex Alice Albright, uh, director of the World Partnership for Education, and also Madam Yande Bonda, who is from Zambia, who is a militant for the rights of children and access to education for w girls, and also co-chair of the Transform Education Program, which is an initiative from the UN for the education of children and young women and girls. I'm also delighted to welcome along with us Madame Audrey Azoulay, who is the uh, d from UNESCO. So you are, uh, you, uh, Madame uh, Rukiat Udrago, you are uh, an actress and you also work uh, in Burkina Faso for equality between men and women. I am delighted to hand you the floor. President of the Republic. Honorable Assembly, good afternoon. I'm Rukiato Wedrago. I am an actress and uh, I also a write uh, uh, plays, and I, I was brought up in Burkina Faso. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. President of the Republic, let me thank you and all those who invited me to come along and take the floor today to speak to you. Burkina Faso is a country which is confronted with by all of the problems that a sub underdeveloped country would actually confront. And also, we have had a real security crisis over the last couple of years and months. Our villages are attacked by uh, by, uh, by by uh, terrorist bands, and the government is actually rec uh, moving backwards. And the population is actually fleeing this violence and ending up in refugee camps. So if that wasn't enough, the, the worldwide pandemic of COVID-19 has actually sh uh, hit upon the society of Burkina Faso. And this is really affecting the population in an unacceptable way. Women and children are the first victims of such crises. We've seen that there's been a greater an increase in, in violence, particularly sexual violence against women and children, an increase in the um, in psychological problems, uh, a dropout of scholarity. Uh, and so you can imagine the whole list of abominations that is happening in my country, and it is so painful to look to see it's this happening. And our country has actually tried to, to get the country back in onto the uh, right path of development, uh, but but we've, we have had development aid, but it's been limited because when, when you look at the general state of the whole continent, my, in my opinion, the population which is actually suffering most knows actually what they need. They know what is lacking. So the society does have a savoir-faire. They know actually what, how they can find solutions to their problems on a daily basis. And what I wanted to look at here today with you is two issues that are of particular importance to me personally. One is female um, genital mutilation, which is an abomination. There is no excuse for this. I suffered FGM. It's a wound which is inflicted upon young women who who then can hand, have serious complications when they, reach to, when they reach the age of sexual maturity and maternity. And this is part of the patriarchy, uh, which is, continues this absurd, absurd uh, tradition which a basic education should eradicate. Let me, let me give you a personal example. After I, had, I was excised, my mother realized the mistake she'd made, and she then 
uh, was educated and cultured, and then she she actually led awareness rising campaigns to try and stop FGM amongst our village. But even today, we still have terrorist attacks. Uh, millions of, of schools have had uh, thousands of schools have had to be closed, and millions of ch children, of young girls, uh, young girls have been descolorized, and this has led to a huge increase in the number of excisions that are, that have been carried out and the number of ch child marriages. And the heart of our society is actually suffering. The schools schools would enable these women, these young girls, to be emancipated. We would not. We're not going to be able to have even an informal economy without a, uh, an educated young population. This is a time bomb where we have no perspective available for our young people. Only education for women and young girls can actually stop this aberration throughout our continent, and that would bring an end to FGM and forced marriage. I'm insisting upon this. I insist upon the education of young girls who are the first sacrificial lambs when families do not have the money to pay for all the children to be scholarized. Young uh, women have um, uh, women are encouraged to have as many to have as children as possible to continue to provide a, a labor force for the country and the terrorist groups who are trying to 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 destabilize our uh, society is actually attacking schools. For us, it's the associative uh, society, which is mainly feminine in my country, which is actually keeping things going. They create small companies. They create associations which can continue. They can continue uh, the, to create a, a, a social tissue within these populations. Women have very little access to responsibility, and yet they are very much involved in these microactivities. Let's not forget that the development of Africa has rested on the shoulders of women. My mother is one of those women. For many years, she actually led the Sodo Association, which helped young women and young girls who were out of school, taught them how to actually um, make soap, karate uh, butter, and to uh, help them to uh, to, to farm or to run small uh, small um, corner shops. These women actually achieved uh, achieved talents through this, which enabled them to actually participate in the budget of their family. The Zodo Association has also led to a rise, uh, has also inc increased awareness uh, rising efforts on um, trying to overcome FGM, forced marriage, and HIV. Um, so th this has been an essential part of our citizenship in my country. So thanks to these microactivities, which has been created by the Association Zodo in my uh, region and in the surrounding region, the local tissue has been able to be repaired on its own. It's actually recovered itself. And we have uh, been able to overcome some of the harm that's been carried by underdevelopment. And we leave it, but we left so much to the caritative societies. And my father and my older brother have um, have, 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 have been uh, affected by, the, by my mother being sick and having to leave her activities to one side. But because of COVID-19, a lot of women have come back to my mother asking her to actually restart the Zodo Association. My mother is a strong woman. She's resilient. She's a combatant. She's a fighter. And she is like all of these women, all of these African women who wage this war every day. And she said that she's quite prepared to get to start this uh, association again and to continue to, with new projects f focusing on the difficulties of today by supporting activities that she can see young people are doing. And if, if we had some aid, if we had aid from international organizations, they could help countries like Burkina Faso to overcome these difficulties. But because of the de degradation of our living standards and our lifestyle, we really need to react immediately. Action is needed now, Mr. President. And that is why I'm here today. That is why I'm speaking to you today. I'd like to thank you for listening to me. I'm very pleased that you've been able, I've been able to, to present my views here today. And I hope that we'll be able to work together to actually find responses to these challenges that my country is facing. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you will have noticed uh, that we are already late, uh, so I'm going to have the very hard task of uh, asking you to keep to, to time. Now, I'm going to hand the floor to Madame Audrey Ozoli, who's uh, Director General of UNESCO. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we could start uh, 
uh, on a positive note, uh, if we look at the progress that has been uh, realized uh, for girls' educations over the last uh, 20 or 25 years, uh, and uh, there's a report, a UNESCO report, which has been published at the same time as this forum, and we have gained 20 points in terms of uh, the number of young girls uh, who finish their primary education. So that is indeed progress, and we must continue in this vein. Uh, this progress is very much uh, concentrated in Asia, so it is not equally spread across the world. Uh, so this means that we have to work harder in some regions of the world. Uh, uh, girls uh, uh, have uh, multiplied by three uh, their participation in ter uh, terms of uh, higher studies. Uh, and the pandemic that we're currently going through uh, came and completely uh, disrupted uh, uh, schooling with the closure of many schools. As you know, in some countries, the uh, schools were closed for 25 weeks. And it's because it's uh, the most vulnerable uh, people who were impacted by the closure of schools. And so there, there is a real risk of uh, regression, uh, moving back. Uh, in UNESCO, we think that there will be 11 million girls uh, who may never be able to return to school, and that is absolutely huge. Uh, and that's on top of the 130 million girls around the world uh, who are already out of school. So public policies uh, and all the international partners uh, pay special attention uh, to this issue of uh, returning to school for girls. Uh, and uh, we should do this uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, remediation. Of course, uh, the education of uh, girls is first and foremost a right. It's an issue of uh, dignity, but also this has an impact on the whole of society, nutrition, development, health, uh, the economy, health, uh, peace, prosperity. And uh, one of the uh, commitments that uh, UNESCO made uh, at this forum is to find uh, 80, uh, to provide for 80 uh, uh, countries uh, and for millions of girls uh, access to school so, and uh, to support uh, quality, but states must also uh, strengthen, and this is one of the major lessons learned uh, from uh, pa the pandemic. We must uh, strengthen uh, investment, the objective that we set, and uh, which has also been taken up uh, by many countries in October. Uh, 15 to 20 percent of public uh, um, uh, expenditure should be devoted to uh, education. You will have the opportunity uh, this year once again to make uh, other commitments uh, in terms of education. I'd like to go back over one point, uh, a point which was uh, raised and which is very important. Uh, and we've worked on this for a long time, and that's the issue of uh, science, of women and science. Uh, this is an area where uh, inequality persists. The last report uh, that UNESCO brought out on science uh, shows that there has been no uh, progress. Only one third of uh, researchers are women. And it's even more serious uh, in major isu issues uh, concerning uh, the um, digital artificial intelligence. Uh, in artificial inf intelligence, we have four times more men than women. And this is, uh, uh, this is about the future of our society. It's a major challenge uh, for uh, training programs. Uh, this all starts with education, uh, education of girls to push them into these particular areas. It's also an uh, issue of uh, ethics uh, for the whole of uh, mankind. And it's a very important uh, uh, chapter of um, a recommendation that the members of UNESCO will be adopting at the end of the year in terms of ethics and artificial intelligence to better take account of uh, bias, uh, bias particularly in terms of gender. So I'd like to uh, greet and uh, uh, celebrate the young uh, people who are here, women who uh, take a risk uh, when they participate in, um, in public life, uh, philosophers, judges, artists, uh, journalists. Uh, and also I'd like to uh, um, pay tribute to those who have been uh, mo uh, role models, uh, particularly to Hillary Rodham Cl Clinton. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Yonde Banda. Yonde Banda. You are the co-president uh, of the Transform Education uh, uh, Program. This is a UN initiative for girls' education in Zambia. You have the floor.
What we have found is that COVID-19 has been the biggest disruptor to education in modern history. It's no longer just a problem. It's meager to call it that. It's a crisis, a crisis in education, and we must act on it urgently. Today, I stand on behalf of the young girls and women who are continuously changing this world and demanding for better. We're demanding for our fundamental human rights, and our messages are clear. Firstly, we demand to see a redesigning and restructuring of our global education systems to make them more inclusive, gender transformative, and accountable. It is clear that we need to invest in our global education systems to ensure that they're yielding to the problems and the key sustainability issues of the world, from the climate crisis to gender equality and leadership. We must change that. Secondly, we're demanding that young girls and women are meaningfully involved in key decision-making spaces and processes. We're not just a photo on the face of a campaign. We're leaders of today, we're change makers, and we're frontliners. Secondly, recognizing that girls' education is key and fundamental to building back equal post-COVID-19. We're demanding that education systems are developed and are changed to suit these world's criteria and this world's needs. Thirdly, we demand to see an investment in making schools safer and free of school-related gender-based violence. This involves ending the already white gender digital divide that has resulted in education becoming a fundamental human right, and instead it has been looked at as a privilege. We're demanding to see that in terms of our health and well-being, girls and young women and the intensification of resource mobilization to provide adequate resources for menstrual hygiene management and ending school-related gender-based violence, SRHR, as well as WASH facilities. Leaving out these constituencies of education only fuels the patriarchy, and we're not that, we're generation equality. We are also demanding to see adequate funding and resourcing in girls' education. Now this one is to the world leaders in this room. Those plans to cut down on international and domestic education expenditure will not work. Pack it up and pack it up permanently. We will not allow you to tamper with our future or our funding. Fourthly, we want to be at the table. Let me rephrase, we need to be at the table the table. We must foster a holistic intergenerational response on acting to the intersections of education, one that is rooted in intergenerational action beyond just intergenerational dialogue. You say that you're all about youth leadership. We say co-create, partner, and fund us, and ensure that we're at the table and meaningfully engaging. Finally, millions of girls, millions of us are expected not to return back to school post COVID-19. Millions of girls have been exposed to teenage pregnancy, have been pushed into childhood labor, and have been exposed to early childhood marriages. This is unacceptable. We must fight this. We're demanding that the we're demanding that our education is put at the center of the resolutions and solutions in the action coalitions and that we rally by investing in ensuring that girls' education changes and challenges the status quo. Now, you say that you will build back better post-COVID-19. We say show us. You say you will create a greener, more prosperous future, and we say show us. Show us gender transformative education systems. Show us an education that centers gender equality and climate, and show us an education that is accessible to all. We have the lived experience, we have the knowledge, and we have the numbers if we work together. World leaders, heads of civil society organization, the media, young girl activists, young activists, if you're with us and for our future, stand now. World leaders, if you're with us and if you're for our future, then stand up. Stand for our future, stand for our funding, and stand for our education. This is no longer an if issue. We must be at the table. We must ensure girls are getting back to school, and we must do it now. I think Yande said it all. Well done, well done. Well, it is an incredible pleasure to be here with everybody uh, this afternoon um, in person. Uh, my last trip to Paris was to Paris before the pandemic. Nice to see you, uh, President Macron. And this is my very first trip since the pandemic, and it is, again, such a pleasure uh, to be here. And it's such an honor to be on the stage with so many incredible activists, friends, who have been on this journey for so many years. And lovely to see you, uh, Secretary Clinton. President Macron, I'd like to thank you so much for your leadership on girls' education and education in general across, across the years. You've been an incredible friend to my organization, and we are uh, most grateful. Since GPE was founded about 20 years ago, 
82 million more girls are on school in our partner countries, 82 million more. So that's progress. But, as my dear friend Audrey has said, 129 million girls are not in school. And nearly one in three girls in very poor countries will never ever set foot in a classroom in their lives. And many girls, even though they are in school, aren't learning very much. And all of those numbers were before the pandemic. And we know that since the pandemic, girls have faced more early childhood marriage, more domestic chores, more sexual violence, and less education. And depending on how you measure it, it's possible that 20 million more girls may never return to school as a result of the pandemic. Why does all of this matter? It matters because educating girls, all of our girls, is the smartest investment a country can make. We can boost economies, we can boost productivity, we can improve health outcomes, we can equip countries to face some of the greatest challenges ahead of this. In particular, as many people have talked about it, climate change. The question in front of us today, 26 years after the Beijing conference, is does the world have the will to transform societies by educating girls? This, my friends, is the challenge of our lifetime. As a partnership and a fund, I can assure you that my organization, GPE, has both the will and the know-how to meet this challenge. We have a bold new vision to help countries transform education. We have hardwired gender equality throughout all of our work. We are changing harmful gender norms and we are identifying systemic and social bottlenecks that make it difficult for girls to get to school. But all of this takes commitment and it takes money. That is why at GPE's financing conference at the end of July in London, hosted by Prime Minister Johnson and President Kenyatta, we are gonna be seeking to raise at least $5 billion for education. Is this ambitious in the moment of pandemic? You bet it's ambitious. But we have no choice to show resolve to get every girl into a classroom. And every girl that we can get into a classroom is a victory over the ravages that the pandemic has had on education. I congratulate all of the young people in the room for inspiring us to do more. Yande and I had a wonderful meeting earlier. Congratulations on your work and you've overcome incredible obstacles. I also want to think about Caroline, a young girl in Kenya who I know, who said, thanks to my teachers, I can learn and dream at the same time. I am a girl who can raise her hand and say, I am here. Let's get the job done together and let's show the political will and put the money necessary to get the job done for good. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Madame Albright. And thank you very much, ladies, for your inspiring words. I'm now call the next panelist, and we're going to talk. Oh, pardon. Maintenant, nous allons parler de la reconstruction d'une économie plus égalitaire et plus juste. To construct an economy which is much more egalitarian and which is much more effective. So we have with us, we've got a whole new panel. We have Madame Aya Shabi, activist, a Tunisian activist, founder of the Young. Uh, Pan-African uh, Network and an, an ex-representative uh, of the uh, Network for Africa. You have the floor, madam. Paris, we are here. We've been waiting for this, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> um, I'm really honored to share the stage with powerful women, especially the youngest female head of state. Um, they said, they said we are too young to lead. I mean, I'm sorry to disappoint them, we're not. <laughs> Um, my name is Aya Shebi. I am a Pan-African feminist. Ten years ago, young women like myself took to the streets and changed the course of history. What you might know as the Arab Spring, but that's a Western narrative, we call it the Revolution of Dignity. Because our slogan was, Shughul Hurriya Karama Wataniya. Jobs, freedom, dignity. It has always been a revolution for economic justice led by women and young people. 
because poverty is sexist. Young African women today are enslaved in human trafficking. They are dying in the Mediterranean. Sexist, discriminatory, Islamophobic laws today ban young women from wearing hijab in some countries and enforce hijab in other countries. Maybe the only advantage we have since 1995 is technology. And even with the digital economy opportunity, 70% of Africa is offline. How are we gonna change all of that and add to it a global pandemic? How many of you here are not vaccinated? Not vaccinated. I am not, and I can tell you, young women in Africa do not have access to vaccines and cannot afford $80 COVID test and 150 visa euro visa fees. And many of them are not here because of that. So how are we gonna change that? What action are we gonna take today? This is intersectional. It cannot be fixed by creating jobs and teaching girls how to code. Poverty cuts across everything. Digital divide, exploitation, border policing. So we need to do something differently this time. We need to use this historic moment to do something differently. And my generation is calling for a new approach to leadership, intergenerational co-leadership, because we cannot inherit systems we didn't co-design. And we're the youngest population in the world, damn it. We have the demographic power, the voting power, the innovation power, the youth-led accountability power. I don't want, as a millennial, to build back better the economy. I want to build forward with equity and feminist economics. We need to change the system because the current system does not work for us. The current racist, patriarchal, neo-colonial system does not work for us, does not provide equal pay for equal work. And the other issue I wanna raise is funding. We need to stop talking about gender equality and start funding gender equality. 40 billion, that is an amazing commitment, but that funding should go directly to women and girls most vulnerable, should go directly to organizations in the grassroots, should go to Jeff Youth Task Force who have done amazing job. Just in minute, minute, see who play. I just want to. I just want to end with the fact that we, as young women, are ready to co-lead with you. In fact, we developed Africa Young Women Beijing Plus Twenty Five Manifesto with ten bold demands. So we're coming here to ask you: Are you ready to lead and co-lead with us? Are you ready to really take these next five years to the next level? Are you ready to unite behind the young feminist agenda? Because we want progress, not promises. And generation equality cannot afford to move forward without Africa and without young people. Thank you. The last, the last thing I want to I wanna say, I'm sorry, because I'm probably the only civil society on this panel, and I would love to hear from the other panelists, especially on the funding issue. I am really sometimes troubled. Why is it that whenever we ask for resources for gender agenda, we are told there is a budget cut or there isn't enough? When there is no budget cut to dig up fossil fuel <laughs> to destroy the planet? Why is it that when there is terrorist attacks in the Sahel region, countries go to fund militarization? but do not fund with the same urgency 20 million girls in the Sahel right now under the age of 18 who have no economic opportunities. So there is money, there is enough, but where is it spent, how is it spent, that's what we need to do differently moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Melinda Gates, you are the co-president of Bill and Melinda Chair Foundation, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I want to say to this community, it's amazing to see the work that you all have done over the last 30 years. And I think, you know, a year ago, we weren't sure we'd be able to gather in person. It's amazing that several hundred of us can be in this room, but even more amazing that we have 40,000 people online. And your commitment to this issue over time is commendable. 
You know, it is better today to be born a girl than it was 26 years ago, but we still have a lot of progress to make to move forward, and I think that's what we're all here to talk about. I want to thank all of you who've been part of my journey of learning and our foundation's journey of learning. We've been at this now for almost a decade, but not nearly as long as you in this room. And I realize and recognize that philanthropy is just, has just one piece of this puzzle alongside activists and civil society and government and business. And that's the piece I'm here to talk about. You know, for those of us in the room who are lucky enough to have been parents or are parents, you know, one of the most joyous moments for us as parents is when we have our little son or daughter and they take those first steps. And sometimes it's left foot forward and then right foot. Or for other kids, it's right foot forward and then left foot. And they stumble and we send them along their way. But the difference is, is that a young boy goes out into the world and he gets to walk and he gets to run. And a young girl today, when she goes into the world, is faced with blocks and barriers and boulders. And we are here to dismantle those boulders. That's why we're here as a community. And no longer a siloed community, but a community that's here with these six action coalitions. It's a historic time. We are not just 26 years on since Beijing. We're living through a pandemic we thought we weren't gonna be living through as a world. My heart goes out to so many families who are still ravaged by this pandemic, families who have lost loved ones and are still sick from this pandemic. And we need to recognize as a community, this has been devastating, devastating for women. You heard earlier from the panel about what it's done to a generation of girls' education. Women are two times as likely to lose their jobs, and that's in the formal sector. We're hardly even counting the informal sector. Childcare is one of the most enormous barriers that women face alongside gender-based violence. In childcare, women were already doing 75% of it before the pandemic. Now they're doing, on average, nine hours a day. Women's health has been affected. Our health systems are starting to fail. Women aren't going there for prenatal visits to deliver their babies. They're not uh, getting contraceptives. So this is a historic time that has put all of this, what has been invisible, in our faces. And so what I'm here to tell you, to tell you from our foundation is that we're committing $2.1 billion of new money We are here as a community to help women, all women, get their power and their influence and to use it in every possible way. So the three action coalitions that we were part of were the economic rights and justice. We've already been working on economic empowerment as a foundation, but we're going to add $650 million around things I call cash, care and data, cash being all those social protection and transfer payments that governments are making, making sure they get into hands of women, on care, making sure that governments actually create good systems of care so care doesn't just fall to women at home and it be expected of them. And on data, we've got to make the invisible visible. We've got to pinpoint places in women's lives and girls' lives where we can intervene and we can then make investments. The second area of our focus will be that of sexual health and reproductive rights. We participated in that group, that working group. I think you know we've been working on women's health for 20 years and family planning for almost a decade. We're gonna put another $1.4 billion in that area. When women have the right to access contraceptives and time and space the births of their children, it leads not just to their empowerment, but to decades and generations of empowerment. And lastly, in the area of feminist leaders and movements, which we were also part of that working group, we're adding $650 million, sorry, we're adding $100 million over the next five years uh, to make sure that we really have women who can lead 
in all places of power, in law, economics, and health. Because women not only should have a seat at the table, they should be in every single room where policy and decisions are being made. What I know is that if you lift up women, if we lift up women and make sure they can use the voices they already have in all places of power, and they have their full power and influence in the world, those women and girls will lift up everybody else. Thank you. Merci, Madame Gates. Thank you very much, Madame Gates. Mrs. Senna Marine, you are our very youngest prime minister, and the floor is yours from the Republic of Finland. Well, thank you so much. And first, let me start by thanking you, President Emmanuel Macron, for your leadership. And Secretary General Guterres, your recent election for a second term is also a vote in favor of our common efforts. Your strong stand on behalf of gender equality sends a powerful global message. And I also, also want to thank the all, uh, the all previous generations that have fight for equality. We wouldn't be here without your work. We need everyone on board in our efforts, women and men. A society that is good for women and girls is a good society for everyone. This conviction has made my country's success possible. My generation knows what great opportunities techno technology presents for us. During the COVID-19 pandemic, technologies have helped to address very concrete problems. Girls and boys alike have had access to school lessons, for example. That said, technology, technology can only bring about progress on equality where it is available. Existing inequalities have also deepened. Globally, new challenges such as online harassment, abuse and hate speech against girls and women have become even more acute. A shadow pandemic, as you might say. In our action coalition on technology and innovation, our efforts range from getting more women into tech to tackling online gender-based violence. We must also address the needs of girls with disabilities. Education is at the center of our attention. Companies from startups to big tech have joined us in addressing online violence, for example. We work at the Council of Europe, within European Union, and in the Freedom Online Coalition, of which Finland is the chair in 2021. Finland is also joining UNICEF in two joint commitments. A group of Friends of Generation Equality works in the European Parliament, thanks to a Finnish initiative. We are happy to announce that the D for D Hub, with its 11 member states, is leading the way here as a commitment makers. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as part of our official development assistance, we will al allocate a total of 100 million euros to advance the goals of generation equality over the five years to come. Finland will allocate 80 million euros of this amount to advancing gender equality in technology and innovation. 20 million, euros, 20 million euros will be allocated to advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights. In addition, the Finnish De Development Finance Institution has committed to increasing its investments to bridge the digital gender gap to 50 million euros. The total Finnish contribution in support of the generation equality goals in developing countries will be 150 million euros. Our commitment also includes being active on the international stage, especially in advancing the women, peace and security agenda. The rights of women and girls and gender equality are a priority in our bid for membership on, of the U UN Human Rights Council for the 22 to 24 term. I invite others to join this bold journey as commitment makers. Only together can we bring close the digital gender gap create safe digital spaces, and ensure an equal future for the benefit of all. Thank you so much. 
Merci beaucoup. Merci, Madame Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Sanna. And now I should like Marie to Pongest. hand over Marie Pangestu, who is Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank. I think it's working. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Self, uh, it turned itself on. <laughs> Excellencies, uh, Secretary Guterres, President uh, Macron, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and friends of this amazing community, whether you're here uh, or listening to us virtually. First, on behalf of the World Bank, uh, let me thank His Excellency President Macron, the Government of Mexico, and UN Women for organizing this amazing forum uh, at this critical juncture of time. Uh, and we have uh, heard from many that COVID-19 has really exposed and exacerbated the deep and persistent inequalities around the world, particularly for women and girls. And the impacts have been very devastating for women and girls, uh, for their families, communities, and societies. And I know uh, all of us here today, we've heard it from all the speakers, uh, previous speakers, agree that this is just simply unacceptable. Uh, especially we heard uh, from uh, the next generation, uh, Juliet, uh, Chantel, uh, and uh, Yande, and many others. So we really have an opportunity now to fix the systems, practices, and funding in order to build a more inclusive recovery. This includes doubling efforts around women's in empowerment and entrepreneurship, education for girls, and better access to sexual and reproductive uh, health services. This is why the World Bank has significantly scaled up its commitments in this area through legislative and policy change and financing. This year, our commitments will reach a record of 4.2 billion in sub-Saharan Africa alone, which is more than double the amount provided the previous year. So <laughs> this amounts to 6.3 billion, which will be implemented in the next year. And wait for it, there's more. Uh, and we plan uh, commitments of 4 billion, up to 4 billion, in the next coming two years, depending on an ambitious IDA replenishment, uh, uh, our fund for the poorest countries. So in sum, this will allow the bank to reach 10 billion by 2023, uh, adding 12 African countries, and most importantly, improve the lives of an estimated 160 million women. The, the current replenishment of IDA is building on this fundamental development pillar, aiming at continued strong and ambitious engagement in favor of women and girls. I think we all believe that it's not just uh, the policy reforms, but the financing. So through both, we will work to accelerate the scale and ambition of girls and women's empowerment. This includes gender parity in secondary schools, preventing child marriage and gender-based violence, eliminating discrimination in the workplace, expanding childcare, and advancing women's entrepreneurship and financial autonomy. Furthermore, the Global Financing Facility, GFF, a multi-stakeholder partnership hosted at the World Bank, is launching today an acceleration plan to help increase access to family planning for 25 million women and adolescents, catalyzing more and better financing in at least 20 countries and scaling up support for women and youth-led advocacy networks over the next five years. Together, uh, as many of you have said, we can reclaim the gains and flip the script to make gender equality a reality. Remember, one quarter, not one half, as, uh, 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 as uh, Pum Sili said. So our target is one half. Let's join hands and do it, and do it for our sisters, daughters, and granddaughters. I thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pangestu. Now we're going to hear some messages from two leaders who couldn't actually join us here in person today, but we know their commitment to gender equality. First of all, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, President of South Africa, and uh, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany. Your Excellency, President Emmanuel Macron, Thank you for hosting us for what is a defining moment in our shared struggle to end gender injustice in every corner of our world. Today I join with leaders across all parts of society to pledge South Africa's commitment to generation equality. 
our deep disdain for injustice and our firm conviction that equality within a generation is possible is founded and based on the belief that we are all born equal. The right of every living person to equal treatment and equal opportunity is irrefutable. This forum is important because of its clear commitment to forge an intergenerational and an intersectoral partnership. When South Africa raised its hand to co-lead the Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights, we stated our intention to advocate globally for economic transformation to benefit the women of the world. We have actively sought to introduce actions into the Global Acceleration Plan that dismantle the systems of injustice and the structures that sustain them to build a global economy that is gender responsive and sensitive. We have called on governments to use their procurement policies as a developmental tool to transfer economic power into the hands of women. We stand side by side with many nations across the world who are committed to ratify the, and implement the ILO Convention 190 and make the world of work free from violence and harassment. Our global commitments include clear actions to promote women's leadership and voice across all action coalitions and to effectively address gender-based violence and femicide. The road ahead will be challenging, but we have the means and the will to achieve equality between women and men in this generation. I thank you. Sehr geehrte Frau Fumsili Mambo Nguka, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, lieber Emanuel. Über 25 Jahre nach der Weltfrauenkonferenz in Peking und der dort verabschiedeten Erklärung sollte Gleichberechtigung eigentlich selbstverständlich sein, ist es aber nicht. Daher sind Initiativen wie die von UN Women, von Frankreich und Mexiko zu diesem Generation Equality Forum immer noch so wichtig. Denn es stimmt, Gleichberechtigung gewinnen wir nur durch das Zusammenwirken aller Generationen in der Politik, in der Wirtschaft, in allen Bereichen der Gesellschaft. Deutschland arbeitet maßgeblich am Aktionsbündnis Wirtschaftliche Gerechtigkeit und Rechte mit und wird weitere 140 Millionen Euro insgesamt damit rund 240 Millionen Euro, in das internationale Aktionsbündnis investieren. Das sind Investitionen, die insbesondere der Bildung von Mädchen sowie fairen Arbeitsbedingungen und der Stärkung der Eigentumsrechte von Frauen zugutekommen. 25 Millionen Euro der neuen Zusage sind für die Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative bestimmt, die wir während der deutschen G20-Präsidentschaft 2017 gegründet haben. Seitdem wurden über 130.000 Unternehmerinnen in mehr als 60 Ländern unterstützt. Um diese Erfolgsgeschichte vorzuschreiben, hoffe ich, dass sich viele weitere Länder dieser Initiative anschließen. Generation Gleichberechtigung, der Name ist Programm. Wir haben es in der Hand, diesem Programm gerecht zu werden. Lassen Sie uns dazu tatkräftig anpacken. Das ist das Signal, das ich mir von diesem Forum wünsche. In diesem Sinne viel Erfolg und herzliche Grüße aus Berlin. Ladies, I thank you very much for your words and commitment. And now I'm going to je vais appeler And now I am going to call Centrale. up to the main stage here Mr. Jean-Yves Le Drian. Qui est déjà là d'ailleurs. Oh, he's already here. Fantastic. Le continent africain est celui the African continent uh, is where we have the most uh, um, women's entrepreneurship initiatives in the 